Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. And I'm here today with my old pal, Richard Fox, uh, who's been analyzing and looking at the local uh, scene for many years now. I'd even say many decades, but I don't want to make him appear to be older than he is. <laughs> we've, uh, we've been talking about politics in New Mexico for a very long time. Uh, he used to write columns for... Uh, Century Magazine and um, has been a, um, an advisor to a great many people who are trying to understand what's actually going on in the world of politics. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, New Mexico's most pressing problem, I think, uh, which is its abysmal poverty and the Im impact it has on our most vulnerable citizens, children, uh, our working poor, um, and the elderly. It's really great to have you with us, Richard. Nice to be back with you on this hot summer day. So this is your third appearance in the Mercury Library. That's right, um, that's right. And this time we're gonna deal with really the most painful of all subjects, I think, in our state. And we're gonna try to put politics and poverty uh, in the context of social health, as you've said. Could you begin to explain that to us and how, and how that works? I'd be glad to. Um, whenever you talk about poverty anywhere, you always have to talk about it as hope's triumph over experience. <laughs> um, at least I always try to do that because it is such a, um, frankly, a gut-wrenching problem that... Um, um, you always have to think about it like there are a lot of bad things happening in the world, and poverty is one of them. But um, to keep some kind of a perspective, to keep from going mad, there are also a lot of good things happening in the world. Yeah. So it's hope's triumph over experience, we, we hope. Yeah. Um, regarding poverty, it seems that Aristotle was, was wrong. Um, Aristotle said that that um, in a democracy, because there would, there would be so many more poor people, that they would have power and that the will of the majority would prevail. Um, I hate to say that Aristotle was wrong, but it turns out that he was. Um, also, the framers, right from the start, uh, we're fearful of a tyranny of a majority. And in creating this elite democracy that we've got, um, they made sure that elites would dominate, not the majority. And they devised a system in which we had, uh, for which uh, property holding white males were fine with hope and opportunity. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the majority um, would not be the rest, in other words. So with Aristotle and the framers, we have right from the, right from the start, um, we have problems. And of course, we have, we have, we have always had poverty. But let me, let me offer about six questions. I mean, just simply to, to stimulate this conversation. First, we want to we wanna look at what's the nature of poverty in America today. Second, we, we want to we wanna look at um, why, as the richest nation the world has ever known, why do we have so much deep-seated poverty in this country? We also want to know, obviously, why it's so difficult, and it, it truly is. Why is it so difficult to reduce poverty in America? Why is that? Um, and you ask yourself, what's it like? to live in America where a poor child's life is so much less valued than a rich child's life. In this country, this is America, yeah. after, after all. Also, I think we, we, um, we have to ask ourselves if we've failed as a people and as a nation um, by not more effectively addressing poverty in America. Robert Kennedy went to, the, uh, went to the Mississippi Delta in the 60s and walked away 
uh, not only shaken, but basically saying that we have, as a people, as, an, as Americans, we failed. So recently we've, we've been learning that New Mexico uh, has the worst childhood poverty in the country and that we are now the poorest state in the Union. Um, we um, have terrible systemic problems that we cannot solve, it seems, and that even in our richest city, Albuquerque, I believe uh, you've mentioned the statistic that we are eighth in the nation in suburban poverty. Albuquerque. Albuquerque. And what is this? What does this say? How do we? What does this say about us? What it does is it begs another question, and this gets us to social health. We have to ask ourselves what or how are we really doing as a nation, really doing. Um, what I mean by that is, is that poverty is a political problem. Fundamentally, it's, it's a political problem, yet it's, it's, it's not in the discourse. It's, it's simply not discussed. Um, President Obama talks about, he uses the word, the vulnerable. Um, poor, the word poverty, of course, raises a red flag. It's, it's okay to talk about homeless veterans. Um, but you mentioned the word welfare in a political context. And, of course, that's a pejorative. Right, right, off, right, off, right off the bat. Um, the reason why we have so much poverty in America is sustained for so long is because of in my judgment, because of existing power arrangements. Right. You asked me, you asked me um, um, years ago, in a column that you wrote for the Albuquerque Tribune, you asked me point blank, why are people poor? And the answer to that question is people are poor because they have no power. Right. They have no voice. Um, they don't participate nearly in proportion to their numbers. And addressing poverty, it seems to me, in 2013 requires, like so many other things, requires a political movement, mm. not simply a political party, or uh, it requires a movement. Um, now, there's an interesting example of this in the, in the current uh, cable political drama, House of Cards, which is an offshoot of the British um, not bad. Anyway, there's a scene in House of Cards where a desperately poor, obviously homeless man tries to, tries to break into a, uh, a house office building in Washington. And he's caught. And the scene shows this desperately poor man um, sitting on a curb with his head in his hands, but he's yelling, screaming about injustice and poverty, oh, and his plight. Enter the scene, Kevin Spacey, who plays a House Majority Whip in this in this um, uh, rather good uh, television political drama. And Spacey goes over to the man who the police are surrounded, <laughs> and Spacey goes over to him and bends down and, and sort of curtly says, "No one, no one will hear you." You have no voice. Oh, God. Nothing will come of this. Oh, God. So why don't you let these police officers take you away, away from all this, meaning get you out of sight yes. is basically the implication. Right. So we have, we have that kind of thing. Now, as, as social health goes, social health basically means quality of life. In politics... It's about who gets the valued things. Oh, nicely put. That's, that's, it's, it, it's what it's about. Who gets the valued things? Now, valued things are everything from freedom and justice and equality all the way over to a decent standard of living. Those are valued things. And I think clearly one of the most important ones is a decent standard of living. Um, Poverty is also about externalities. In other words, an externality is an unintended consequence 
of a policy or a system. In our case, it's democratic capitalism. And an externality of democratic capitalism really are two big things. One is poverty, the unintended consequence of capitalism. And and uh, we get things like pollution as well, unintended. Right. But um, And we get inequality as a result of democratic capitalism. So an unintended consequence of, of capitalism, which is a as an economic theory, is really all about one thing, and is accumulating more capital. You have uh, very rich companies preying on very poor people. So you can actually get a $200 loan, and you have to pay back for five, $600 in order to meet your obligation. That's one of those externalities that are so that keeps everybody down, it's like a nail in the coffin. And for too many people, it's, it's many nails in the coffin. Yes, yes over and over again. Uh, to, to get a $200 payday loan, you wind up indeed paying about $600, $600 back. The externality aspect of all of this is these are unintended consequences that somebody else pays for. Yes, right, right, right. It's what, it's what others pay for. We pay for it. We pay for poverty in America as, par, as, as, a, as a consequence of the, of the externality. Um, corporate profits, wealth and income maldistributed. Yes. Um, these are these are all externalities of a democratic capitalistic system. Now I'm not har here to argue against against um, um, capitalism, but in this country we have a we have a, a, a corporate media that is dominated by news of technology, news of scandal. News of financial matters, news of GDP, right. news of the weather, news of and, and much, much, much news of the weather, <laughs> uh, three or four times in a newscast. <laughs> right. And we've we've uh, we've we've had fun making making light of that. But the thing is, is that, is that there's so much about social health, quality of life. The GDP do, simply does not measure. Right. I mean, it simply doesn't it simply doesn't capture it. And we have a gap. We have a big gap in this country um, um, between GDP and social health. The deteriorating social health, how are we really doing as a country, which is deteriorating rapidly. In New Mexico, particularly, our social health is, we're not doing very well. In the nation, we're not doing very well. And um, we measure everything, often in financial terms, forgetting that we don't live in we don't live in markets right. we live in societies yes. that's how we live we live in societies not in markets and life should surely be more than a commercial transaction over and over again whether you're rich or poor yes um because we don't live in that kind of world. we should not live and we, we really don't live in a in a world of of commercial transactions in other words gdp does not measure so many things that make life worth living. And yet that's what that's what is often talked about right. in in not just media discourse, but in political discourse, social discourse, business discourse. Um, it's not about making a life, not simply making a living. It's about it's about that. It's a, it should be about our social health. If I could just read a very quick, very short quote, sure. um, very short, from, from Robert Kennedy um, when he was a senator. Kennedy said, quote, the gross domestic product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage. It measures neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. In short, it measures everything except that which makes life worth living. What a there are certain social health indicators, and these are very, very 
unfortunately, very, very prominent in New Mexico. To run through just a few, infant mortality. The United States ranks about 17th in the world in infant mortality. Child abuse, child poverty, adult and youth suicide, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, high school dropouts, um, teenage births, kids having kids. 70% of New Mexico's births are paid for by Medicaid. 70% are paid for by Medicaid. Divorce, unemployment and underemployment. We have a serious problem with, a, with the value of the minimum wage. Yes, we do. We have a serious problem in raising it. But it's also terribly undervalued. The lack of health care, domestic violence, poverty, violent crime, DWI fatalities, affordable housing, inequality, fetal alcohol syndrome, poor schools, obesity, gambling addiction, behavioral health, people who suffer from depression, which is a widespread problem, and indeed hunger. People in America who are genuinely hungry and not, and not just ready for dinner, as, as, it, as, it, as it were. Um, so the question becomes then, as a matter of social health, with, with, within which there is poverty, how are we really doing as a nation? as we talk about the economy and Wall Street and and all the rest. So if you have an absence of poverty in the discourse, if you have um, absolutely, um, well, virtually no discussion at all, you certainly don't ever put together a list, a coordinated, woven list of problems that indicate the level of one's nations in one state social health um, how how do you how do you one how do you one get it into the into the discourse what has to happen in order to have this terrible condition of being so poor that you have to indeed worry about your next meal which could happen to any one of us I mean it's always this thing which everybody thinks now nah, is not going to happen if there's a bad jail in Valencia County and I get stopped and I suddenly end up there, well, I'd be in trouble, but I'm never going to get up there. Am I ever going to be poor? Absolutely not. This is never going to happen to me. But it could. It could happen to anybody. So how do we insert this into the discourse? It is, it is a difficult question, and it's, 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 it's just a seemingly a, a, the most daunting problem. We've all heard uh, how many people are one paycheck away yeah. from from poverty um, with medical bills the largest source of bankruptcy in America is the inability to pay your doctor bills um, but we also have and this is actually weirdly getting a little bit better um, we have to cut through the invisibility of poverty mm. in other words for a long time I think for for most of us in our age and, and, and younger um, Poverty has always been rather invisible. In other words, we don't think about it. Um, it's invisible because um, poor people don't make campaign contributions. And there are no, there's no national association of poor people in Washington, uh, unemployed uh, people. There's no national association for that. Um, there are 13,000 lobbyists in Washington, but, but there are virtually none. Oh, there are a few. There are a few... Uh, saints that are working the halls of Congress, but not many. Um, but it's becoming more visible. We have we have in this country almost half the country is is in and out of poverty. Particularly since 2000, 2008. we have six million people in America that that exist exclusively. All they have six million are food stamps. And this morning, I, um, um, being the C-SPAN junkie that I am, um, I listened to a debate on the floor of the House, uh, debating a revised, so-called revised farm bill, right. which, if passed, um, would virtually eliminate food stamps in in America. Jeez. Um, also, so it's 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 more it's, it's shall we say less invisible today. 
I also remember Jimmy Carter talking about, um, back during the 96 Olympics, talking about Atlanta. Two Atlantas, like there are two Americas. Right. Um, there is sort of booster Atlanta, mm. and then there's the other Atlanta of, of poor people in Atlanta. But Carter was talking about the fact that, and this is 96, talking about the fact that, that most of us simply don't know any poor people. They're not in our lives. Right. However, today, particularly after 2008, the Great Recession, which we're still in, um, most of us know people. We know people, um, uh, maybe even as friends, who are who are poor. Um, that helps get at this. I mean, just getting it into the discourse um, to effective action. Also, getting into the discourse means um, cutting through the myths. Then there are the myths. The myths that politics, or excuse me, poverty is a character flaw. Yeah, right. Somehow it's a flaw in our yeah, character. Um, American manufacturing is going to bounce back, um, oh, yeah. and, and uh, it's not going to bounce back. Another myth is the Great Recession has ended. The Great Recession hasn't ended. Maybe in, in the halls of the Federal Reserve it's ended, <laughs> but, but not in, um, not in uh, uh, Deming, New Mexico. It hasn't, it hasn't ended. And the myth that nobody goes hungry in America is is certainly not true um and then this 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 insidious myth of ethnic minorities get most of government entitlements there's that myth right. public attitudes um, america takes care of its veterans it's a big myth it's a, it's a it's a huge myth government handouts created the nation's deficit myth <laughs> america's wealthiest pay more in taxes because they earn more money. Now, this is one of those truthy, this is one of those truthy statements. It's, it's truthy. <laughs> but, of course, it's, it's simply not true, especially when you look at proportion of income, right. proportion of their income that they pay in taxes, and that they pay very, very little capital gains tax mm -hmm. in America. Um, Medicaid takes care of health care for the poor. Uh, an enormous myth that, that ought to be in the discourse to be to be dispelled, poverty doesn't exist in the suburbs. We we now know that poverty is is alive and well in the suburbs, sadly, and maybe the biggest myth of all, uh, and that is the the Horatio Alger myth of anyone can make it in America on his own. Um, in fact, nobody can make it in America on their own. Um, uh, we owe a great debt to others. And I often tell my students this: we have an enormous debt to other people. We can never fully repay that debt, but we can certainly draw down on it by certainly attacking a problem like this. When we talk about poverty, it's like talking about uh, war. It's a big abstraction. What poverty means in so many ways is intimate. Pain, intimate anxiety, waking up in the middle of the night wondering where are you going to get your rent? Where are you going to find the food to feed your children? How are you going to get gas in the car? How can you possibly find a job when you're out looking constantly day in and day out and there's no work that's going to pay you enough money to keep you alive? Uh, I think really in the strangest way, many, many Americans know this from their childhoods, from the early days of their lives. I mean, I certainly know this. I mean, we all do. Um, we, we tend to hide from it. We tend, we tend to push it aside. But there are simply undeniable realities that, um, that we can't just throw up our hands and walk away from. I mean, they are there. The numbers are real, right? The numbers, the numbers are terribly real. And they are indisputable. Um, one out of eight Americans is is one out of eight is is poor. Um, and the way we measure that, for those who are watching that want to know how we how we measure that, um, 
We measure it for a family of four. The poverty line is $22,400. For a family of one, it's about 13000 My God. Now, obviously, there are people who make higher, somewhat higher incomes than that that are that are still poor, but but here are the here are the hard facts, and like I say, they are they are not disputable. One out of eight Americans is poor. One out of six children are poor in the whole country. In the whole country, one out of six. Oh, God. Um, six million people, as I said earlier, um, have nothing but food stamps. They exist on only food stamps. God. Um, so we have forty, approximately forty-seven million Americans either at or below the poverty line. Now, this is up from 37 million pre-2008 pre collapse. 20 million of the 47 million are in deep poverty. And again, I don't mean to blizzard you with statistics, no, but, but these, are, these are hard realities. In, in the nation, 16 million children are poor, 22% of children. 10 million of those 16 million of children are in deep poverty. In deep. Deep poverty. Deep poverty. Uh, in New Mexico, uh, 31%, almost a third of New Mexico's children are poor. Now, this is the 16 million in the nation. This is the highest since 1962. Jeez. This is the highest since Michael Harrington's book, The Other America. Right. The highest. And it's the highest percentage of children poor since 1993. Wow. New Mexico is the poorest state in America. And it, it, it appears, if you're talking about, if you want to talk about psychoanalyzing it and, oh, yeah. and its identity, the state's identity uh, in the nation, um, you're talking about an identity that includes, we, we look like a developed third world country. We look like an advanced third world country in New Mexico. Developed, yes. Advanced, maybe, yes. But still, a third world country. Now, I know a lot of people won't like that, but there are a lot of things about poverty that people don't want to hear or will deny uh, over and over again. So, um, for example, near Las Cruces, there, there, and to the west of Las Cruces particularly, there are colonias. Yes. These are, these are basically trailers and and, and shacks with unpaved roads, no utilities, and um, a great deal of human misery in New Mexico. And I found that there are approximately 130,000 people in New Mexico living in colonias. Wow. Um, the Chaparral Colonia is, even, is, is merely one example near Las, near Las Cruces. Um, it's a good this, sized town. Really. It is. Um, now, this has an enormous impact on social health, whether we like it or not. Um, an enormous impact on learning. Now, we, we've both been teachers. Um, my wife has been a teacher for over 40 years. And it is not merely an excuse. Poverty can't be an excuse for poor, for poor schools or poor learning outcomes. Um, it has a it has a deep, lasting uh, impact on emotional and cognitive development. There is no malnutrition um, is is a problem. Uh, illness is a problem. You know there are some students that I know that they're always sick. Yes. They're always and they never get better. They, they've always got the flu or they're always tired or they're always ill. Um, this, this, this puts on people, basically, an enormous stress every day. Yeah. And with stress, you get all kinds of other problems, but you also get an enormous amount of distraction. If a kid comes to school and he lives in a home with domestic violence, or a student, for that matter, that's living in domestic violence, this is an enormous distraction. They can't think, they certainly can't concentrate. They can't write, and they, they might like to, but they can't because they're thinking about the other world in which they live after they get out of school. 
Absolutely. So it's an enormous impairment. It is. And it's lasting. In so many ways, it's a kind, it's a matter of, it's a matter of empathy. It's a matter of putting yourselves into the lives of someone else. If, um, if you've been ill, even if you're well off, if you've been ill and have been forced to work while being ill and trying to do good work and learn things that are difficult to learn and all the rest, you know exactly what it's like to be a poor child in New Mexico. You have absolutely no excuse to have no empathy. I mean, you know if your toe hurts or your ankle hurts or your you have headaches or whatever it might be, and you still have to perform, you know exactly what it's like going to school every day, being poor, and having no breakfast, and worrying about your mother, and worrying about your dad, and your brothers and sisters, and all the rest of it, and your house caving in, or whatever, you know. You know. There, there's a, uh, so there's really no, there's no um, experiential reason for a lack, for a lack of social empathy, in my judgment. It's, I think it's, it, today it's almost impossible if you live in the world, if you're out in the world, in any capacity, to not be uh, empathetic and, 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 and sympathetic. Um, particularly if you have kids, and particularly if you have any other contact with children or young adults or college students, um, if you don't, if you don't have uh, a certain amount of empathy, um, it seems to me that you're living in, a, in almost another world. Yeah. Um, but let's look look at let's look at child poverty. Let's look at children in poverty, which I would think uh, would would grab uh, and produce a lot of empathy. Child poverty in America. There are 15 over 15 million, almost 16 million poor kids in America. 22 percent. Also. Children living in, in extreme poverty, over 7 million. Now, these are Bureau of Labor statistics, um, IRS statistics, Brookings Institution. Um, the number of adults and children receiving temporary assistance for needy families, what we call TANF, T-A-N-F, is 4.5 million that they're receiving assistance. And, of course, obviously that doesn't meet the need. The number of children receiving food stamps, kids receiving food stamps, 18, over 18 million. The number of children in the school lunch program um, is over 31 million on school, on, in a school lunch program. Thank God. Um, the number of women and children receiving WIC, which is a supplemental nutrition program, WIC, um, almost 9 million. So, you know, statistics take us only so far, but I, like I say, I think the invisibility of poverty is, frankly, becoming less and less. Therefore, it's becoming, it's becoming more, and more and more difficult to keep it out of the political discourse. I, I, uh, even in, in the reddest of red state constituencies, I think it's getting more and more difficult to, to not talk about it. Um, that's also, that's my hope that it would be talked about, but it's all, I think it's becoming harder and harder to, to not talk about it. Um, even, like I say, even in the, even in the uh, uh, reddest of red state constituencies. Even in New uh, Mexico. Even in New Mexico. Yeah. I, I think that, that I, I, when I look at the governor's agenda, the Martinez administration agenda, um, I don't see. Now, I'm not talking about um, economic development, and I'm not talking about tax cuts that may bear fruit in a generation. I'm talking about immediate, desperate poverty today. I don't see it on the Martinez administration agenda. If it's on the agenda, I don't think it, it's, at the, it's, it's anywhere near the top of it. Isn't it true that really neither Republicans nor Democrats have ever done much about child poverty in our state? I think, in fairness, um, to both parties and to a whole host of dedicated, over, over, over the years, uh, dedicated, uh, well-intentioned, and sometimes effective public servants in this state. I think it's a question of... of the need being so great 
over so many years and generations that even a, a, a considerable effort by public policymakers, politicians, um, makes it look like, and, and I'm not saying it's not the case, but make it, makes it look like that we haven't done very much. But it's, it's all in proportion to the need. And the need in New Mexico for generations has been so great that the, even the, 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 the substantial effort that's been made, um, it, it doesn't seem like we've, we've done very much. And we certainly haven't done enough. I think, and in, in, I'm trying to be fair, but it, it, I think it brings us to the question of why is it so hard to yeah. reduce it? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's where we are in this conversation. And there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of stigmatization in not only being poor, being afraid and being poor and being stigmatized, but there's also a lot of political fear and fear of being stigmatized if you are a politician um, and you want to do something about it. It's, it's a risk in today's politics to champion something that God knows needs to be championed. And that is, and that is, that is poverty in America. It's a certain political risk. Why? Um, because in part, because since 2008, um, I think political attitudes have hardened. Uh, sure. Public opinion has hardened. I'm, sa uh, I'm sorry to say. By that I mean when public attitudes harden, we hear more talk, believe it or not, which might be hard for, for two guys like us to, to, to realize, but we, we hear more blame the victim talk. Yes, we do. We hear more... Um, but there's a whole classified ad section full of jobs out there. And we hear, you're not working hard enough. But look, um, if, you look at, if you look at the not working hard enough public attitude, you see this. You see people who have worked hard for generations. And no matter how hard they work, they're still poor. Yes. No matter how hard they work, this this of course is it represents a systemic problem, um, and again this this myth of making it on your own. Anybody can make it in America. Anybody can make it on his own in America. Um, nobody makes it on their own in America. We have a debt. We owe other people. We owe institutions. We owe. Um, the rule of law. We owe, yes. frankly, government. Yes. We owe. We owe a big debt to a lot of people. And we can never fully repay it. But we can draw down on it by working, working against uh, and working to address poverty and, and, not simply, and not simply not talk about it or simply worry about it. Um, we, we owe ourselves at least that much. It seems like with... With families and and with friends, um, always the way uh, out of intractable problems is to start talking about them. Is to what uh, I guess psychologists and psychiatrists call processing. It's very difficult. You get into arguments. You get into fights. You get everybody mad. Everybody gets up, but. In the long run, eventually, even if you're meeting intractable oppositions, things soften. People tire. They begin to hear other uh, perspectives that even, even if their ideologies won't acknowledge them, deep in their conscience they understand those perspectives are right. Uh, with inequality, um, that... Um, that kind of processing is particularly difficult because everybody feels in one way or another one down to everybody else. I'm not quite sure why that is. Perhaps, uh, perhaps Donald Trump doesn't feel one down, uh, but most people do. Yeah. 
So what is it about inequality uh, that makes things so hard? What makes it so hard is, is I mean, regarding inequality, of course, is that it does uh, contribute mightily to poverty. But um, I think, and, and things are changing in this regard. After the, again, the 2008 financial collapse, the Great Recession, which we're still in, um, Americans generally like to think of themselves as middle class, uh, regardless wh whether they are or not. They do. Yeah. And, and um, certainly knowing some, some very affluent people who, who like to say they're, they're, they're still middle class. And I think we might begin in the processing, as you put it, um, um, with, with the fact that the top 1%, this is inequality, the top 1% in America own or control owner control, almost half the wealth and income in the country, the top 1%. The top 10% own or control almost 66% of the wealth and income in the country, own or control. The top 10% own 90% of all stock in America. Most Americans have no assets. They have no assets. In other words, an asset is something that you own outright, not, not something you're paying on. Right. Not something if you're paying on a loan or a mortgage or something like that. You don't own it. You don't own the house or you don't own the car. So most Americans have, have no assets. Uh, so we might, we might begin by, by looking at American self-interest. Um, it is it is certainly not in a poor person's interest to be poor, but it's also not in our self-interest to continue to tolerate and accept those kinds of those kinds of inequalities that I just I just described. In other words, it's it becomes a matter of self-interest to um, not only keep yourself out of poverty, but to realize that, that um, we're all poor in a way if we live in that kind of nation, with that kind of inequality and that kind of poverty. We're all poor. Yes. It's like, it's like um, John Donne, the famous English Englishman once said regarding... regarding uh, he said, every death diminishes me. Uh, and that's often used in, a, in, a, in an argument against capital punishment. But I'm using it is in, in the sense that deep-seated poverty diminishes me, even if I'm not poor. Yes. Um, so it's part of the processing to, I think, realize things like this. So this... The sense of diminishment uh, is really palpable and personal and not at all abstract. Um, you, can't, um, you can't truly enjoy the luck of your life. And most things are. Most good things are about luck. And most bad things are too. Uh, it seems that there is more bad than good, but you can't really enjoy the joys of your life and the look of your life. If the vast majority of the people around you are suffering, how can you possibly do that? I mean, not only does it, I mean, it isn't morally difficult, if I can use that sort of bland term, but it's also, um, it's also really dangerous. Not, not because poor people are violent, or more violent than rich people. In point of fact, that's totally false. Uh, who has the power to be violent? Rich people do. Uh, but it's, it's in a way, um, it takes the food out of our own souls to be in a world in which people are starving to death when you're not. Well, let me let me uh, let me take a stab at the impossible. Um, 
I think that that somehow we need to close this this gap in America between Americans taking comfort in in American values. Um, Americans, we as Americans, like to think about the fact that we have certain we have certain values, constitutional values, political values, indeed moral values, and that's 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 surely a good thing. Yeah. But as um, as I believe T. S. Eliot once said, between the ideal in this case, the ideals and the reality falls the shadow. Yes. And, and I think that, that there, has to be, there has to be some, not only realization, but we have to act on it. There has to be some closing of this gap between idealistic American values and the reality of, 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 of everyday life in America for an increasingly large number of people. And that reality, our, our subject today, that reality is desperate poverty. Yeah. Or a low-wage job, a job that you might be working very hard for a, a job that doesn't pay a living wage. For example, we live in a, we live in a service, we now are living in a service economy. 80% um, of the American economy is services. Now that's doctors to dishwashers, yes. everything in between. And when you have 80% of the economy that services, with indeed, with technology, but you have 80% services, you have a low wage economy. Right. And yes, technology has produced many changes, many of them good. But when I look at technology, I often see many, many good changes, but no progress. On this front, nice. um, nice so w with technology in a in a service economy, you have you have increased productivity, but you can do it with fewer people, and wages have not kept up with technological advances. The wages have simply have not kept up. So we have this we have this service economy with with uh, a lot of low wage incomes. But we have the, the sort of the false consciousness that we're, 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 we're doing pretty well. You know, we, if we can get 2.5 or 3% GDP growth, you know, we're ecstatic. But meanwhile, the social health of the country, with those indicators that I mentioned, continues to decline. Well, we know something has to be done, largely because... Um, those people without power uh, basically have an enormous monopoly on all the bad things that life can bring. Uh, who do you dump all your trash on? You dump it on poor people. And um, one example of it after another. So I would be very interested to hear your prescription. Whenever the conversation reaches this point, I always... I always relish the fact and sort of wallow in the luxury that I am not running for public office. <laughs> so I can be, I'm, I'm going to be brutally, brutally honest, but I have that luxury. Um, I don't have to worry about personal political ambition or anybody else's, quite frankly. So what, what, what do we do? What's, what's called for? Well, the first thing that's called for, in my judgment, is massive, massive public investment. Now, I know in this time of austerity, that is uh, a, very, uh, a very bad song to sing. That's a sinful thing. Oh, it's a horrible thing. Oh. But we need massive public investment. Why do we need it? We need, we need massive public investment to produce incomes from work, uh, for child care. We need to buck up the safety net, which is terribly frayed. We need housing. We need criminal justice reform. We do. We need prison industrial complex reform. 
We do. We need to get away from this trend towards privatization and pitting privatization versus um, public investment. We need to do that. Um, we we need a, somehow we need a what I would call a fairness lobby. Wonder. Um, Wonder. We need a fairness lobby in the sense that we need those, frankly, people with influence who are willing to realize that the, 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 the a living wage, increasing the minimum wage for a living wage is indeed a no-brainer yeah. for income security yeah. right away. Um, women and children first. In my, in my massive public investment, women and children should be first. We need a jobs, jobs, jobs plan, which for my money means public jobs yeah. within this massive public investment. Um, we need affordable housing. And we've made some inroads in catching up with a problem with the mortgage collapse earlier. We need a universal food delivery system. Yeah, we do. We do. Richard. A universal food delivery system. To and we know you know I know you know firsthand about about storehouses and 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 food storehouses in in, in New Mexico and now particularly Albuquerque, um, but they can't keep food in stock. No way. Uh, no and way. again, the, these are people who are genuinely hungry, not just ready for dinner. Yeah. Um, as I as I so hard to do this right. And again, we need to overhaul the prison industrial complex along with the criminal justice system. These are huge agenda items. Um, we need aggressive, equitable, progressive tax laws. In other words, I think the wealthiest of, among us, the wealthiest Americans, ought to pay as leech, at least as much tax as they paid prior to 2001. At least as much, wow. it seems to me. Mm. Um, we need single payer health insurance. You've heard this. You and I have heard this many, many times from many, many people. We've read about it. Um, we know about it. We need it. Um, and I think we need, I really think we need a White House conference on poverty. One of the mysteries of and I'm certainly a supporter and, and, and an admirer of President Obama. Always have been. Um, but one of the things I don't understand is his reluctance to be aggressive about this problem. Yes, he's put enormous focus on the middle class, and, and I'm delighted, uh, and the erosion of it. But I think we need a White House conference on poverty, even more than that, we need a we need a national urban policy. Oh boy! Um, I've been looking and reading about these days, um, reading uh, a very fine journalist by the name of Chris Hedges, and I've been reading about Camden, Camden, New Jersey, where they barely have a police department. Right. In Camden, right. and of course, in recent days, we have the the uh, apparently impending bankruptcy of Detroit. We need a national urban policy. But I think over, overarching all of it is, is massive public investment. And I don't particularly care whether Mitch McConnell or John Boehner like that or not. That's, that's what we need. Richard, thank you so very, very much. There's no question that that, um, that the private sector is not about providing work. It is not about uh, solving social problems. It is not about anything but making money. Uh, we need government. We need vast public investment, not to do busy work, but to do work that needs to be done. Roads, dams, bridges, hospitals, healthcare, teachers, all those things that, I'm sorry, the marketplace just simply cannot provide. Richard, thank you, as always. We'll call you back again, if we might, uh, in the future. As, as, as always, um, it's, been, it's been, my, been my pleasure.